Good morning, everyone. In this election year of 2020, the term green has been irreversibly linked to the movement of the Green New Deal. A promise of better air, better water, a better planet, and less environmental toxins. Yet environmental toxins have been historically overlooked, especially as they affect male reproductive function. This presentation will focus on the impact of environmental toxins on male reproductive health. These are my disclosures and none of them are pertinent to this presentation. So as I said, I'm gonna focus on toxicants and male reproductive health. And I think it's only fitting to begin with this quote from Rachel Carson's edition of Silent Spring in 1962, and I quote, through ignorance, greed, and negligence, governments have allowed poisonous and biologically potent chemicals to fall indiscriminately into the hands of persons wholly ignorant of their potentials for harm. So the objectives of this presentation will to briefly review the history of reproductive toxins, to highlight the classification of toxicants, and to detail the impact of specific chemical toxins. So we're gonna cite bisphenol A, or BPA, phthalates, glycol ethers, which are in the class of solvents, and DBCP as the prototypic pesticide. So there is a history of chemical exposure and male reproductive failure. Yet despite recognition for 200 years of adverse effects of specific compounds on the testes, knowledge in the field of male reproductive toxicology is still quite limited. Historically, chimney sweeps were noted to develop scrotal cancer as early as the 1700s. Impaired fertility in workmen exposed to lead was first reported in the 1970s, and cadmium levels were found to markedly increase in the semen of heavy smokers, resulting in a loss of Sertoli cell type junctions and ultimate impaired sperm production. Increased interest and concern about a connection between environmental chemicals and human cancer resulted from Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Three decades later, 30 years later, Theo Colburn, author of Our Stolen Futures, proposed a relationship between impaired male reproductive health and cited endocrine disrupting chemicals, EDCs, and environmental estrogens, EEs, in the environment. These theories attracted enormous interest, debate, and still produce much controversy. This is an interesting syndrome related to these toxins known as the testicular dysgenesis syndrome, which was coined by Skaka back in 2001. This is a condition of four disorders, poor semen quality, testicular cancer, hypospadias, and cryptorchidism. There has been a time-related increase in these disorders over the past 50 years, and this increased incidence has led some researchers to conclude that, quote, exposure to individual chemicals with estrogenic or anti-androgenic activities, these EDCs, have resulted in male reproductive dysfunction. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm gonna to classify toxicants into four areas, endocrine disrupting chemicals, EDCs, and hormone mimics, chemicals having diverse actions that impair cellular function, chemicals that cause cancer, and toxins that can relate in isolated, severe testicular damage. So let's talk just briefly about some of these uh, toxicants. Endocrine disruptors are also known as endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. It's a group of exogenous chemicals that mimic or antagonize the effect of endogenous hormones, <clears throat> induce changes in expression and or activity of hormones, and can alter circulating levels of hormones. The timing of exposure to these environmental toxins is critical. There is a window of increased susceptibility in embryos during the first trimester of pregnancy, and in this case, especially uh, the impact on male embryos. These toxins can have a less effect on male reproductive function during childhood and, and adolescence, yet they do have some effect. There's been a lot written about these toxins as carcinogens, and especially as they relate to testis cancer. 
we know that testicular cancer has increased by about 51% in the United States between 1975 and 95, with a current increase theoretically in these EDCs. Much controversy exists regarding the relative impact of genetic versus environmental factors resulting in testicular cancer. Scientific literature cites factors during early gestation, such as high maternal estrogens, that may play a role in the genesis of testis cancer. We know that increased exposure to anti-androgens and certain pesticides that inhibit synthesis or action of androgens may initiate testis cancer. And epidemiological studies have presented evidence that high levels of environmental exposure to aromatic hydrocarbons also can result in testis cancer. And most importantly, there is a six-fold increase in seminoma found in polyvinyl chloride or PVC plastic workers. For today's presentation, I want to talk about the following chemicals. First, representing endocrine disrupting chemicals, bisphenol A or phthalates, a prototypic solvent, glycol ethers, and then a pesticide uh, that has been widely uh, investigated, and that is DBCP. Let's begin with BPA. So bisphenol A is a monomer used in the manufacturing of plastics and epoxy resins. About 100 tons are released into the atmosphere each year during production phases. Now BPA is found in food storage containers, like the clear plastic containers we use when we um, heat our food uh, in microwaves. They also are found in the lining of food cans and dental resins. BPA binds to nuclear and plasma membrane bound estrogen receptors and act as an agonist. BPA has also been shown to leach from products due to incomplete polymerization and degradation by exposure to high temperatures, such as putting these containers in microwaves. BPA has been diversely measured uh, in many different body fluids. It's been measured in the serum and urine of adults, amniotic fluid and fetal plasma, and especially in breast milk. There's been much work done on uh, laboratory animals uh, looking at the prenatal effect uh, on male reproductive organs when animals are exposed to bisphenol A. Uh, in some mouse studies, it has been demonstrated there is a decrease in the anogenital distance, which we know approaches increased uh, feminization. Also, increased prostatic size, which is quite surprising, but decreased epididymal weight and adult daily sperm production, which one would predict in a higher endocrine estrogen environment. There are several BPA human studies. There are two studies that found that women with polycystic ovarian syndrome had elevated levels of BPA. Levels of serum BPA have been correlated with circulating androgen levels. And a correlation was also found between elevated BPA and FSH levels in epoxy resin workers. BPA has been electively removed from the manufacturing of baby bottles sold in the USA by six of the largest manufacturers, attesting to its recognized harmful potential. Yet it has not been removed from all baby bottles and certainly not from all plastic containers. Let's take a look at phthalates. These are esters of benzene dicarboxylic acid and DEHP or DEP is the most common. There are 2 million tons of these compounds produced each year worldwide. Phthalate metabolites are common findings in the urine on two cross-sectional studies in the United States. It is used in plastics to improve flexibility of the plastic and in cosmetics to help bind fragrances to the solvent. It is used to manufacture PVC pipes and tubing. So the tubing that you have in the hospital running from the bottles of saline, the bags of saline into the arm of patients is leaching this, these chemicals. It also is found, unfortunately, in baby toys, carpet backing, paint and glue, 
and also in soap, shampoo, hairspray, cosmetics, perfumes, insects repellents, and a host of other commonly used liquids. It does have an anti-androgen effect, and this has been demonstrated through its action as an aromatase inhibitor, an androgen receptor antagonist, and as estrogen receptor agonist. There is also a very interesting syndrome known as the phthalate syndrome. This was discovered by prenatal exposure of phthalates to rats, which results in malformations of the epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, and prostate. It also results in hypospadias and a decreased anogenital distance, again, representing increased feminization. Also, cryptorchidism. Now, I think many of you will recognize that this is quite similar to Skakovac's testicular dysgenesis syndrome, uh, which we talked about initially. And we know that this syndrome has been linked to increased environmental estrogens. Phthalates are found in breast milk, which therefore give infants a postnatal, ex a postnatal exposure. Phthalate metabolites can be measured in breast milk and found to change hormone levels in breastfeeding boys. There was a study that looked at the amount of phthalate in breast milk compared to babies who were bottle fed and that was in the women who had high phthalate levels, there was a six-fold increase in phthalates uh, in their male infants. Increased phthalate levels causes changes in LH to free testosterone ratio, as well as SHBG and LH, with changes in SHBG resulting in changes in free testosterone. Certainly these are signs of endocrine disruption. There's also a recognized inverse relationship between phthalates and free testosterone, and again, in the anogenital distance. There's also been studies looking at the possible effects of phthalates on human fertility. In a study of infertility patients, it was found that there is a phthalate dose response, response relationship that causes a decrease in sperm motility and actual sperm concentration. Increased phthalates have also been associated with poor sperm morphology, and phthalates have been associated with increased DNA sperm damage, which is a very hot topic nowadays in terms of DNA fragmentation and increased uh, fetal loss. Let's talk uh, about solvents. And here we're gonna use glycol ether as a uh, well-recognized solvent. Glycol ethers are a group of solvents derived from alkyl ethers of ethylene glycol. There is over 1 million pounds produced yearly uh, of ethylene glycol monomethyl ether, or EGME. Its industrial uses are found in the semiconductor industry and especially in clean rooms, in photographic film, printing inks, jet fuel, uh, antifreeze, and uh, multiple types of paints, varnishes, and dyes. There have been many studies of these glycol ethers using laboratory animals. This uh, is some data from both rat and rabbit studies, in which in animals exposed to these ethers, the uh, investigators found decreased testis weight, Atrophy of the germinal epithelium and seminiferous tubules as seen here, represented by almost a Sertoli cell only pattern in the experiment animals. A pancytopenia and thymic atrophy, as well as total reduction in body weights of these animals. The effect on male reproduction has also been studied. Shipyard workers exposed to glycol ethers in the form of pain fumes resulted in incre increased oligospermia in these men. In infertile patients, those with occupational exposure to glycol ethers had decreased modal sperm count. And also glycol ether was and combined with trichloroethylene are used together in the semiconductor industry and in clean rooms. In fact, Richard Clapp studied workers' mortality in the manufacturing of computers and related electronic equipment uh, while working at IBM. And this has led actually to a civil lawsuit. 
they have 31,000 deaths for which they have a work history and corporate mortality files. And these were closely examined by this investigator. What they found was a statistically significant increase in cancer. And this was of multiple organs, including the testes and male genital organs, among others. So a lawsuit was filed against IBM, alleging that cancer deaths, testicular cancers especially, and birth defects resulted from workplace exposures to these toxins in the clean rooms. The case was settled for an undisclosed amount, certainly giving credibility to the association between these chemicals and cancer. I wanna conclude by talking about a unique toxicant, DBCP. Now this is dibromochloropropane, and it's the only known environmental toxin with a selective testis toxicity found in the human. Yeah. Let me give you a little history about this chemical. It was produced for 20 years, ending in 1979. It's a soil fumigant, nematicide. It kills, this, it kills nematodes in the soil, used primarily for both the banana and pineapple growing industries. It's very volatile as well as fat soluble or lipophilic. And it's well absorbed from both the lungs, skin, and gastrointestinal tract if ingested. It is metabolized to a cytotoxic and mutagenic metabolite. And it causes unique testicular pathophysiology. <clears throat> it's thought that increased glutathione transferase in the seminiferous tubules of men leads to the formation of reactive epoxides, which are toxic. These epoxides bind to DNA, leading to single-strand DNA breaks and apoptosis or cell death, hence loss of sperm production. Now, the reason this ended up being a problem in the industry is as follows. Torkelson, who was working at the time for Shell, performed the original DBCP animal research, and he was the one who established industry standards. So he was then testing what would be the lowest concentration that could cause damage in these experimental animals. The lowest concentration he tested was five parts per million. And what he found at five parts per million was that there was effect primarily on the testes, leading to severe tubular atrophy and degeneration. So what he reasoned, therefore, was that a safe exposure limit in workers could be set by decreasing this environmental limit by one-fifth to one part per million. But he never tested this concentration on the experimental animal before it was allowed to be the industry standard for humans. What resulted, as seen here in these headlines, in 1977 was that in Lathrop, California, the site of a uh, shell manufacturing plant of DBCP, this became the first major episode of worker infertility related to ex ex occupational exposure to DBCP. And it was found that these workers in the plant, when talking amongst themselves, found that they as a group were unable to father children. Don Wharton, an epidemiologist, then came into the plants uh, and started investigating this chemical uh, in 22 factory workers at the camp, at the plant in Lathrop, California. He found that 50% of workers formulating, actually manufacturing DBCP for over three years have sperm densities of less than a million. We then studied two manufacturing sites at the request of Shell and Dow, both of whom were manufacturers of this chemical. We looked at Mobile, which was a newer plant where DBCP was produced from 76 to 77, as well as Denver, an older plant where DBCP had produced for 20 years, but stopped in 76. We then, we used adjusted hours of exposure. In other words, we looked at exposure hours but then multiplied by a weighted factor to reflect the extent of exposure. So men who were handling it on the assembly line would have higher adjusted hours. 
The data analysis revealed decreased sperm density at both sites, but with different dose responses. In other words, at mobile, we saw a decreased sperm count when we reached 100 adjusted hours, but this plant was short-term production, but had a much more recent exposure to the people we tested. Denver had over a thousand adjusted hours before we could see decreased sperm count, but it was a longer operated facility with a longer DBCP exposure, but a longer DBCP free interval since production stopped. So these differences in semen quality at the longer versus the shorter operated plant we felt likely reflected regenerative changes in the testes once the gonadotoxic insult or DBCP had been removed. So to test this hypothesis, we actually brought 14 patients down to the medical center to the uh, clinical testing facilities at the time at St. Luke's. These men had biopsies which showed varied non-characteristic patterns of impaired sperm production but they all showed a marked improvement in their semen analyses since first analysis, and no other organ system was found. Potashnik in Israel completed a 17-year post-DBCP factory worker exposure evaluation, and he found likewise frequent regenerative effects, even in azospermic patients. Since that time, applicators and agricultural workers have also uh, been tested uh, because they were concerned that they also would have the same effect. Uh, there were some decreased sperm counts reported in selected studies in some of these applicators, but two comprehensive government studies of DBC field workers in Hawaii showed no change in sperm count or morphology. So that the concept of a gonadotoxic risk to DBCB applicators remains very controversial, but is ongoing with two active uh, lawsuits involving Nicaraguan and uh, Costa Rican workers still in the courts in the United States today. So to conclude, environmental toxins remain a potential health hazard, often affecting the male reproductive tract. The mechanisms of actions are either by disrupting the endocrine system or by direct cellular toxicity. Industry, retailers, and government agencies are taking steps to monitor and decrease these harmful effects. To the extent that several manufacturers, such as Nalgene and retailers, Walmart, Toys R Us, have strictly curtailed the sale of BPA-containing baby bottles and reusable water bottles that we all use. In 2007, addressing phthalates, the bill AB 1108 was passed prohibiting the manufacturing and sales of certain toys and childcare products containing specific types of phthalates exceeding one tenth of 1%, a very low level. OSHA proposes to amend its existing regulations for exposure to glycol ethers based on the Assistant Secretary of Health's belief that, quote, current permissible exposure levels do not adequately protect employees, especially from reproductive and developmental health effects. And lastly, DBCP has been banned from the use in the United States in 1979 and ceased sales to foreign country, countries in 1980. So I quote, again from Rachel Carson, the obligation to endure as the human race gives us the right to know. Thank you.